I began my ethnographic research in Albania on racialization and racial belonging um, in 2006. At that time, I was an undergraduate student participating in an ethno-archaeological project in northern Albania in the Shala Valley, an area um, known as Theth. And at the time, I uh, was doing work as a part of an archaeology team. We were doing survey archaeology, but most people in the area had never encountered a Black person before. Uh, some had not even seen Black people on TV before because at that time, a lot of people didn't have access to even television. And so I, beginning on day one, I was having very intense encounters with people. And at the time, I did not speak Albanian, but I often wound up in homes having coffees with people. People. people would insist that I join them in their houses uh, to talk about who I was and about identity. And again, I didn't speak Albanian at the time, so I was kind of making do with words. <laughs> and at times, some people would be able to translate for me. But it was during that summer that I recognized that I had a big passion an interest in cultural anthropology and really wanted to explore more about the global production of race in particular. I'm currently completing my book manuscript, which is based upon research since 2006. I've done uh, numerous stints of ethnographic research uh, since 2006 um, in Albania with longer stints uh, between the years of 2008, 2009, as well as from 2013 to 2014. This picture here uh, comes from a, it's a communist era stamp that uh, well, was featured in Albania. And it says, um, the year um, against racism and discrimination. Uh, and so this stamp here was part of our communist propaganda. Uh, and I thought it was a, a unique image here to include. The questions that I'm asking here today are not uh, a part of uh, the work that I'm, some of, I'm sorry, I should start over. It's related to the work that I'm doing in my book, but in particular, I'm currently working on a paper that is addressing explicitly anti-Blackness and anti-Zeganism, and so I'll be presenting from that. I am also, uh, I'm also working on sections of my book and a, 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 an additional chapter that's addressing questions of whiteness and marginalization. So for today, I'm thinking about how an analysis of anti-Blackness allows scholars um, to think through contemporary manifestations of anti-Zeganism in Albania and the Balkan region. What insights does this yield about whiteness and the racialization of Albanians? And finally, how does this contribute to conversations of global race and race making? This picture here comes from Shkoza. It's an area just outside of Tirana. Uh, and at the time, there were about 50 to 60 uh, Rom Roma and Egyptian families living in this area. And they were all living here in these uh, barracks and shanties and uh, along here uh, by the riverbank. And at the time, these apartment buildings were empty. Um, right now, the municipality has gotten rid of all of these units, but in or all of the barracks, but it has built concrete units in place. Uh, and so, uh, but at the time when I was doing a lot of my, oh, I'm so sorry, at the time when I was doing a lot of my research, uh, this is what the area of schools looked like. And so this was one of my primary research sites at the time. And I wanted to give a picture to have an uh, idea of an image of where I was, but also too to help distinguish between Roma and Balkan Egyptians or Egyptians. So Egyptians in Albania and throughout the Balkans are often included under the broader banner of Roma or Romani, but Balkan Egyptians in Albania, as well as Kosovo and Macedonia, a certain Afro-descendant identity as opposed to one of Indian descent or Indian heritage. Most Balkan Egyptians primarily speak Albanian, not Romani. Uh, there are mixed marriages between Roma and Egyptians. And there are, um, in the case of Shkos, I would say that while Shkos had quite a few Romani persons, there was a significant, I would say about one third of the residents living here were Egyptian. Uh, there are divisions and tensions between Roma and Egyptians, but for my research purposes, I particularly look at the ways that both groups are racialized as Black. And one of the frameworks that that happens in is this notion of Dor Ezez, uh, which means uh, 
black hands or black side, black people, and relation to Dore Bard, which, uh, which Rums and Egyptians and Tirana use to indicate white people, white Albanians, the white side. This idea, though, that there are that Egyptians and Roma are distinct from one another um, is not one that is uh, where tension is absent. There are many Roma communities broadly in Europe and throughout the world who don't think that Egyptians are a separate group, but rather they might be uh, Roma who have assimilated very differently or that um, in the period since the 1970s or 80s, a group of Roma who asserted a type of Egyptian lineage as opposed to Indian, but that in fact they are Roma from India, right? So there are scholars and thinkers and activists who do not acknowledge an Egyptian identity. Uh, the root itself, the word gypsy itself is a misnomer, right? Because Roma were thought to be from Egypt and that's where that word gypsy comes from. So there's quite a bit of confusion too around the two categories. Um, but in Tirana, there is, uh, in many ways, both with Roman Egyptians and Albanians, there's a common understanding that they are distinct groups. Now, the ways that those two groups are marked, though, can vary. So for many, when my interviews with many Albanians who recognize that there are two groups, they tend to talk about groups that are more assimilated, in this case, often Egyptians, and Roma who are not. And this uh, highlights, well, I mean, this speaks to work done by scholars such as Elena Lenz, who has done research with Roma in Russia and also made note of this type of distinction between different kinds of Roma groups, right? And there are other examples as well. Um, I wanted to go ahead and make this distinction now, though. I'm not going to get into too much around the roots of e Egyptian identity and the emergences of it in the Balkans, though I am happy to talk about that in the Q&A, and I do have a chapter about this in my book. But I wanted to make this distinction now because for those who are unfamiliar with the region, many people get confused and think that I might be referencing people who are members of the present day or who are citizens of the present day Egyptian nation state, and that's not too unrefined referring to here. Um, but also it's important as well because even though Egyptians do not assert a Romani identity or Romani heritage and they don't speak Romani, uh, Roman Egyptians are, again, like I said, racialized uh, collectively in this way of, around Blackness. And they both adopt the language of Blackness to talk about what it means to be a Black person in Albania, which is what is uh, important for, my, for this talk in our context today. I also want to note that categories Dora Zez and Dora Bar are not formal categories, so you won't see these, for example, in formal government writings or documents. And also, they don't necessarily get employed in the same way across all regions of Albania. And so I want to make note to you of, the, of what I have been ethnographically studying in Tirana, as well as how these categories have shifted, particularly since um, 19, the late 1990s and into today. In discussing approaches to anti-Ziganism, I want to highlight the work by, um, by several scholars and first want to define anti-Ziganism. It's a particular form of racism. The, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance defines anti-Ziganism as, quote, a specific form of racism, an ideology founded on racial superiority, a form of dehumanization and institutional racism nurtured by historical discrimination, which is expressed among others by violence, hate speech, exploitation, stigmatization, and the most blatant kind of discrimination. That's a lot, that's a very big definition there. I think it's important for this conversation in looking at anti-Ziganism alongside anti-Blackness to think about the work, particularly highlighting the work of Roma scholars and also um, the ways that they have approached anti-Ziganism. So in Hancock, um, has, has written extensively about anti-Ziganism as well as about uh, lead, a leading scholar of Roma studies, Romani studies, uh, was uh, a professor at University of Texas at Austin and recently retired. And um, in many of his writings, Ian Hancock draws attention to the ways that anti-Ziganism works alongside the phenomenon of non-territoriality. That is that Roma often find themselves as, quote, outsiders in everybody's ethnic territory. 
Um, Ioana Brabiescu says that uh, anti-Ziganism has been defined within the paradigm of biological racism. But this is in contrast to a type of cultural racism. Uh, she says that uh, anti-Ziganism is a concept that stands for the racist behavior towards a constructed other as there is no real gypsy, right? So going back to our idea too of what who a gypsy even is, this identity has been constructed from the first encounters between Roma and non-Roma in Europe. Anidi Trehan and um, Angela Koltz uh, say that uh, anti-Ziganism envelops Roma. It is persistent. There is little respite from violence produced by deeply embedded anti-Gypsyism across Europe. And anti-Gypsyism being another term um, as well, I'd be happy in the Q&A to discuss that more with people about the differences between those terms and their uh, usages. And then finally, um, Eniko um, Vinch writes about the ghettoization and the production of marginal space, which illustrates how capitalism and racism function through one another in post-socialist space. And this is one way that she gets at uh, um, anti-Ziganism in her work. And so for this talk today, what I really want to think about is kn knowing these approaches that exist to anti-Ziganism and uh, then th introducing an idea, uh, or introducing an idea, introducing anti-Blackness into the conversation for thinking about anti-Ziganism specifically and the region, the Russian, East European, Southeast Europe, <laughs> Balkan region, right? So even first and foremost, a question of, of who are we? What is the name of our region? But then also in thinking about the role that uh, that racism play, race and racism play explicitly, and then in particularly focusing on the position of Roma. What does anti-Blackness, or what do theories of anti-Blackness allow us to do when we think in this way, if we think with these, uh, thinking with anti-Blackness and anti-Ziganism together? What, what is productive about this? What is generative from doing this type of analytical, um, analytical or, or taking this type of analytical approach? And so um, Joelle Vargas, who's a, a social cultural anthropologist, says that anti-Blackness is an underlying, mostly unaddressed logic that generates oppression in units of and across the Black diaspora. He further notes that, quote, anti-Blackness renders the experience of Blackness permanently uncertain, the only certainty being precisely uncertainty. It is not a matter of whether brutalization and degradation will happen. It is a matter of when. The Black is not citizen human, so the non-Black is citizen human. Writing about anti-Blackness and or writing about Blackness and anti-Blackness, um, scholar Christina Sharp notes that um, her and her approach to anti-Blackness is one that focuses on being what she calls in the wake to ask what it means to occupy and to be occupied by the continuous and changing present of slavery's as yet unresolved unfolding. And here I also want to think about the work of such scholars as Sadia Hartman, uh, who uh, um, like Christina Sharp think about um, this moment of, uh, of what in the wake of slavery, right? Um, in Hartman's case, thinking about the ways that slavery um, has, has not yet ended, right? Uh, in, in, in thinking about the Americas. Um, and the unresolved unfolding is particularly useful here when thinking about Sharp's approach to Blackness and anti-Blackness. And then finally, highlighting the work of people, of scholars like Vincent Lloyd and Andrew Previtt, who point to the, it, both the interpersonal and structural dimensions of harm done to Black people. So the anti-Blackness is able to capture this in a way that a framework such as racism is not. And I just want to go back for a second, because I, I failed to mention that, right, that when we're talking about anti-Zeganism, we're talking about anti-Blackness, um, that we're also we're thinking about the particular forms of racism and particular groups. And so this is why I said that for the purposes of this work too, that distinction between Roma and, and Egyptians is important. But in, in this case, especially the ways that Egyptians are racialized, right, um, as well as um, not in Albania, but in places like Kosovo, Ashkali as well, it's maybe a term some of you have heard. But the ways that Roma, Egyptian, and Ashkali are racialized um, in this very collective way, um, in this very way around Blackness and the Balkans is really important for this type, this, this, these distinct forms of racism to those groups. And similarly thinking about the distinct forms of racism when we're thinking about the anti-Black uh, framework. So what I want to do now is I'm going to draw attention to 
um, some more specifics in Albania and from my research. But first, I want to uh, show this video of James Baldwin, um, which I think very eloquently uh, frames the next discussion that I want to talk about in terms of how I see uh, anti-Blackness as a way of informing um, or, or, or rather of, of being able to shed light on understandings around being, around place, um, and around racism. A boy last week, he was 16 in San Francisco, told me on television, thank God we got to talk. Maybe somebody was out to listen. He said, I got no country, I got no flag, he's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. I don't have any evidence to prove that he does. They were tearing down his house because San Francisco is engaging as well. Most northern cities now are engaged in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. It, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, a, is an accomplice to this fact. Now this, we're talking about human beings. It's not such a thing as a monolithic wall or you know some abstraction called the negro problem these negro boys and girls who at 16 and 17 don't believe the country means anything that it says don't feel they have any place here on the basis of the performance of the entire country well, now, Jim, no, am i exaggerating no i certainly could not say that you're exaggerating Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So this picture here is taken from about 2013, late 2013, early 2014 of a Romani neighborhood that was on uh, the Licini, the, the lake, the national lake in Tirana. The neighborhood had about 50 to 55 people living in it. Uh, ma the majority were Roma, though there were Egyptian families who were there as well, or and Egyptian persons who were there. Many of the people had been here, settled in this neighborhood for about uh, 10 years or more. And uh, though they were all connected to, uh, I'm sorry, though many of them were connected to one person, uh, through what was called an Albanian feast, so like a, a clan or a tribe. Um, not everyone was directly related to one another, right? Uh, but this group was, had been here in this area uh, for, um, and I'm sorry, I said, I said 10 years, I'm, just, I'm sorry, for 15 to 20 years um, along the lake. And there had been people moving in and out, so some were itinerant, but for the most part, many had uh, settled here in Tirana. And during this time, the municipality in Tirana had begun passing new ordinance and ordinances and new laws determining which types of structures were formal and formal housing and which were informal. And at this time, many of the Roma settlements and Roma housing were marked as informal. And the rule that was going to follow was that if people were not able to get that marking of formal housing and have the right permits and access that the municipality was going to be able to destroy the houses. And so at this time, many activists and advocates were holding protests in the streets, were meeting with members of the municipality, trying to advocate on behalf of Roman and Egyptian families, and not just at the lake, but throughout Tirana. I had been doing some ethnographic research at the lake during this time with a few members who had been, uh, who had recently relocated to the lake because they had lost their housing in the area of Salit in Tirana. And so they had found some temporary housing at the lake. And so James Baldwin's comment there about urban renewal really meaning Negro removal uh, is very generative for thinking about what happens. And so um, there are many scholars uh, who have done work, uh, many Roma scholars who draw attention to evictions and housing uh, and the violence that's been enacted upon Roma communities throughout uh, Europe and particularly looking at uh, the Balkan region. And so here um, in the fall of 2015, 
the municipality in Tirana decided that this neighborhood was going to be destroyed. And the residents of the neighborhood were given very little time to try to change that decision, nor did they have concrete answers as to where they might be relocated. Uh, at the time, the municipality had begun using older communist factories to, to temporarily house Roma and Egyptians who had housing in places like Salit, like Breglumi, and like um, Lachini, like the lake. Um, but when the decision was made here, many people tried to fight back and once they met with the um, ombuds and other local officials to try to stop the destruction of the neighborhoods. But in the fall of 2015, around September, uh, late September, early October, uh, the neighborhood was, uh, was demolished in the name of, uh, of uh, a beautification and renewal project because the city wanted to be able to change the, the landscape around the lake uh, to build more apartments and to develop more tourism. And so I have some pictures here um, about what, what that looked like and what some of the, uh, and, and this particular uh, picture here comes from people who um, live nearby, but also lost their housing in these um, urban renewal projects. I also have done work on race and the body and in what I, uh, in embodied racisms. I recently published a work on um, that uh, is featured here on living and moving with Zor, exploring racism, embodiment and health in Albania. And this work comes out of some of the ethnic research that I conducted in 2013 and 2014 in the Shkos neighborhood. So going back to that neighborhood where I said it was one of my primary research sites. At the time, I was very interested in understanding constructions of Blackness and how people constructed Black identities. And I, it, but as I increasingly spent more time and conducted more interviews and spent more time with families, I began to notice in particular uh, uh, more issues around reproductive health. Uh, the, in fact, the very first day I arrived in the neighborhood uh, when I was meeting with some friends of friends who had introduced me to some of the community leaders, one of the leaders took me around the neighborhood to just uh, meet some people and get to know people there. And one of the women approached me and told me that her baby died. That was one of the first words she said to me. And uh, I had learned then that day that there had been at least three infants under the age of four months who had died in the neighborhood over about a 15 or 16 month period. And then as I began to do my research over the next year, I um, did more interviews with people that, uh, again, I was uh, looking at first around constructions of blackness and whiteness, but so much attention was, uh, in a lot of the interviews was drawn on, uh, especially women and their health and reproductive health, but also just um, in terms of health and their bodies and their bodies over time. And through this research, I really uh, began to work with this con the notion of ZOR, which uh, means um, hardship or difficulty or constraint, but can also mean um, obligation or force. And so in this latest work I uh, just published, I talk about the impacts of racism over time and really thinking about how ZOR might be a way for us to understand what that looks like for Roma, particularly Roma women and health um, and health outcomes over time in Albania. What I broadly want to do though with this work is thinking about the embodiment of racism over time and the ways that anti-Zionism and anti-Blackness draw attention to uh, and force us to really think about what that means. And so I shared here um, a, a picture from Diana Ann Davis's recent work on reproductive injustice uh, because in this text here, she calls attention to Black women's reproductive health outcomes in the US and those uh, disparities that are so deeply embedded and deeply entrenched that cannot be explained away by class, right? And so in the United States, a black woman with a PhD has, uh, has worse um, reproductive health outcomes than a white woman with a GED. And there's been more extensive research about this in the past four or five years as, as there has been more media attention to the maternal mortality rate in the United States. Uh, researchers in, uh, in the Balkans, and I'm particularly thinking about um, researchers like um, Teresa Janovic, have uh, in the past few years been drawing more attention to reproductive health outcomes 
of Roma women in the Balkans, but have also noted that um, there is still a gap in even collecting data and understanding uh, what um, what health looks like, what reproductive health outcomes look like for Roma women. Um, and furthermore, that many of the broader projects that are sponsored by organizations by the European Union um, and 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 um, and also the United Nations draw attention to issues around uh, respect or tolerance, um, but really don't um, don't pay as close enough attention to health and health outcomes, and they don't do so with an intersectional lens. And so, in thinking about race and embodied racisms over time, it's very important too that when we're talking about these particular forms of racism against Roman Egyptians and against and thinking about Black folks and you know the Black diaspora, and also what that intersectional analysis looks like. Um, I also here to uh, have a both, um, an image about um, Clarence Gravely's work about how race itself becomes biology and the embodiment of social inequality, which is what uh, essentially what I'm arguing for um, a need to to draw more attention to, and and this. Um, this post here came from the uh, European Roma Rights Commission and thinking about Roma inclusion and talking about racism and mental health, right? How the how racism is embodied in terms of and its impacts on the body and health, including mental health. And this particular piece was looking at Roma youth across Europe. And so I, I, I share all this to not necessarily just think about a comparative approach, right? So not trying to argue that, oh, let's just compare the experiences of Black folks in the Americas or Black folks across the diaspora uh, with Roma and Egyptians. Um, and rather, I'm trying to think about what a relational analysis um, looks like. One of the key points that Joel Vargas makes in his work on anti-Blackness is that um, in what way, or one of the key questions he asks is, what ways does anti-Blackness enable us to think as well about the racism towards non-Black groups, right? Um, so in his work, he's talking particularly about towards uh, Latinx populations uh, and as well as Asian populations, right? How does an understanding of anti-Blackness help us to understand uh, these other forms of racism? And I think this type of relational approach of thinking about uh, race in this very relational way can be very helpful, but this is not an effort to reduce categories or subsume one into another. Um, so for instance, there are accounts of slavery and frameworks of the non-human or the subhuman that are relevant both for Roma in Europe as well as for, um, for, for Black folks in the Americas, right? Um, but there has to be, when we do this type of relational analysis and thinking, there has to be emphasis on the unique lived experience of the transatlantic slave trade and the history of chattel slavery in the Americas, as well as the um, impact of the Poramos, which is the Romani Holocaust, right? Uh, last week, I was just listening to a young woman who um, does research about, uh, or does research in Romani studies and talked about the constant erasure and absence of Roma from our discussions of the Holocaust in Europe um, and, and really thinking about the Holocaust as this pivotal moment in shaping um, what it means to, to be Roma and shaping also our understanding of um, anti-Zagonism, of Romophobia today. But that's so often left out of our writings and our teachings and our scholarship about uh, a post-World War II Europe. And so again, thinking about these uh, concepts in a relational way and how we might be able to draw from them, um, as, as, uh, but not necessarily thinking about how we're trying to uh, just make a one-to-one -one, uh, connection or to subsume one into another. Also, the role of denial is particularly important because both are active, both anti-Zagonism and anti-Blackness are actively denied. Uh, and this is uh, very much related to how white supremacy and whiteness are performed and enacted and maintained because it also requires a denial of this type of existence of these forms of racism. Um, and uh, I can answer, address this more in Q&A because um, I really appreciate, I really like um, Ioana Barbiescu's 
uh, framing and distinction between anti-Ziganism and Romophobia because she locates Romophobia as part of this denial of anti-Ziganism. And again, I can discuss that more in Q&A, but that but denial plays a big and a very uh, prominent role in how we understand both anti-Blackness and anti-Ziganism. And then it ultimately, call, they both call attention though to whiteness, right? And the ways that whiteness is constructed in response to um, or in relation to um, into blackness, right? Into uh, Romani ness. And so, to uh, for the final part of the talk, I want to then think about uh, what this means in a local Albanian context and this question of whiteness. Because we go back to um, the talk, you know, thinking about um, out outsiders, outcasts, and others. And so, Albanians. Um, are, um, have, uh, so I'm featuring here these images uh, from, sorry, I have to go to my guide here. Um, these images here uh, um, from uh, a book from Wild Europe. And so this is about a section of, uh, in, in this text in which there was a focus of, of travel writers um, and historians trying to discover people with tales. This is in the, uh, in, as late as the 19th century. And there were beliefs, widespread beliefs throughout the Balkan region that there are people with tales, that there were Albanians with tales. Um, and so um, this, uh, that there was a, um, there were Serbian officials such as Vladan uh, Dordovic, who was a politician and member of the Serbian Academy of Sciences, who categorized Albanians as bloodthirsty, stunted, animal-like individuals, so invincibly ignorant that they could not tell sugar from snow. These modern uh, troglodytes reminded him of the pre-humans who slept in trees to which they were fastened by tails. And the troglodytes meaning uh, a term that was used by early uh, racial uh, pseudoscientists who were looking at human taxonomies and the troglodytes were people who were um, akin to like a, our understanding of a caveman or like a pre-person, right? So I, I share these though to, to point out the ways that these very biological ideas of racism have absolutely been used to shape the Balkans and Albanians in particular, right? And, and so um, what does it mean if we're talking about uh, a, a post-communist, uh, very uh, thing like 21st century understanding and questioning of whiteness and what it means to enact a type of whiteness, but also for Albanians to be racialized outside of that whiteness, or, or, or you know, or to ask, um, how are they, right? And so, um, and so. In order to get at and understand this framework of others and outsiders, I, and as well as outcasts, I think it's really important to, to, uh, to ask how Albanians themselves are racialized in ways outside of whiteness. And in doing so, this is not to uh, minimize the anti-Zagonism and the racism experienced by Roma and Egyptians in Albania, but rather for thinking about race in terms of global constructs of race and racialization, this is a call attention to questions about whiteness and Europeanness and who gets racialized inside and out of it. How do these European racial projects shift over time, really getting us to think about the ways that these very biological ideas of race um, in some ways are still prevalent and common, but also then challenging our understandings of race um, and, and, and really think, pushing us to think about the socio-political and economic framework of race, right? Even though we know that Th these racial logics, which are shaped by these biological ideas of race, are still at play, right? Um, Albanians, uh, in my research with Albanians, many people uh, will uh, talk about both a uh, relation to whiteness and blackness, right? That that they want a type of European belonging that absolutely is tied to a construction of understanding of what it means to be white, to be authentically European, and yet at the same time acknowledge the ways that they see themselves as othered, that they also might adopt language of blackness to identify their own experiences, especially after um, the fall of communism.
Uh, so for this, frameworks of Orientalism, Balkanism, and othering, you know, drawing on scholars like Edward Said, Maria Todorova, Mary Neuberger, and Tanya Petrovich are very important for thinking about how these constructions of othering happen, right? Um, what the relationship is to the Orient. Uh, thinking about Tanya Petrovich's work and this creation of the latest category of, you know, the Western Balkans, right? Even though there is no Eastern, Northern, or Southern Balkans, but what does that speak to? And it speaks to who's included in the European Union, but also draw attention to who is European and what does it mean to be European? And in my book, I argue that that has a lot to do, uh, that, that, that this artist is largely shaped by understandings of whiteness. Um, there's a need to disentangle this, though, the ethnic from the racial, right? So the Balkans and notions of ancient ethnic hatreds. Um, and so ethnicity and ethnic, uh, ethnically, uh, ethnic hatred, um, that these are largely shaped, especially particularly thinking about the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia, um, but, as, but as well and how um, globally the Balkans is situated and, um, and, and, and how these uh, relationships between people in the Balkans are understood in terms of very ancient and, and, and in some ways also understood to be permanent, right? And so I feel like this framework of thinking about racialization actually allows a different entry point into understanding um, understanding the relations within the Balkan space. Uh, but then also, rather than thinking about how do we take Western concepts and categories such as whiteness and blackness, and, and then to apply those to the Balkans, I think that the Balkans gives us a really good opportunity to ask what can relations in the Balkans along axes of race and ethnicity tell us about race, and particularly thinking about race globally. And what does this tell us about Europeanness and whiteness, especially in this moment? Thinking about Nicola Nixon's work on the figure of Skanderbeg, right, and the idea of being, quote, always already European, that there has been a move by Albanians, uh, especially in the last 10 years, 15 years, in asserting what it means to be European and using the figure of Skanderbeg as um, someone who was trying to save Europe from the Ottomans and therefore saving Europe from Muslims, right? Uh, and so the role then that racialization and religion play too in shaping and constructing who's European and who has full access to European whiteness. Uh, and so that's why I end with this question on this, on this slide too, the full invitation to white racial belonging, whether that's there. I also want to draw attention to um, the work of people, uh, and I'm sorry, um, I got my uh, documents a little uh, out of order here. Um, but really thinking about, too, the work of people like um, Angus Bancroft and Aniko Imre and Maya Miskovich and thinking about how Roma have often been constructed or even dealt with as only a social problem, but not necessarily as an issue of race or racism, right? But that absolutely there is, um, as um, Aniko Imre says, an insistence, even if it's unspoken, there is an insistence on whiteness or asserting a type of Europeanness that happens in, in Southeast Europe and in, in Eastern Europe in uh, relation to Roma and Egyptians. And so ultimately kind of asking this question of what does it mean for groups like Albanians to both feel as though, uh, believe and think that they are uh, racially outside or outcast and and to see themselves or, or, or to employ the language of racial outsiders and even of blackness, and yet at the same time perform a type of white racial superiority, uh, white supremacy in relation to, uh, to Roma and to Egyptians. And then how do we understand this as well in the broader context, not just in the local Albanian setting, but uh, with, uh, in conjunction with migration? Uh, with religion, uh, with uh, understanding capitalism. This, uh, this data here actually comes from a survey that I'm still in the process of working through, but I wanted to share some of the preliminary findings. I did a survey several years ago, about uh, it's five years, so six years ago now, I did the, the collected data from young um, Albanians uh, between the ages of 18 to 25 and asking questions as they understood it around, around belonging, racial belonging, and what they understood to be race and racism. And this was majority white Albanians uh, who filled out these surveys. Um, so uh, very few Roma and Egyptians. Uh, and in this way, I, want, I asked questions about 
of the experiences of Albanians and whether people thought Albanians experienced racism. And I did so because a part of the work that I do in my book is really getting at how people understand terminology, right? Because just because we have translations for words like race, like uh, racism, so razza, razzismi, doesn't necessarily mean that people in the Balkans interpret those words in the same way. And so I think that one of the important tasks that anthropologists have at hand is to think about local understandings and local interpretations. And so I did, I uh, devised this survey with two research assistants to gather some data. And so you'll see this big, the big word here is Grechi, which is, um, which is Greek, right? And yes, I left this in Albanian, uh, but I'm going to tell you the words for those that, that, need, that, um, that don't see, that, I'm sorry, for those that don't um, speak or read Albanian. Uh, but the first word is Grechi, which is Greece. And so the question that I asked, so this, this, this word cloud here is based upon answers to the questions about Albanians' experience with racism. And so the, the biggest, most prominent word that was featured in so many of the surveys was um, Greece, as well as um, immigrant, immigration, uh, shiptar, which is a pejorative term. Um, Alba the word for Albanian in Albanian, uh, word for Albanian in Albanian is shiptar, and it has a Q after the H here. Uh, but shiptar is a uh, pejorative term that's used um, to uh, mark Albanians. Uh, and so um, discrimination, discriminim, embrach, which is backwards, uh, perendemore, which is west, so uh, Western Europe, perendemore, Europa. Um, Haidu, which is thief, stereotype, culture, media, uh, behavior, um, immigration, uh, prejudice, respect, uh, bottom, people, rights, uh, and in forms of discrimination, uh, mentality, Serbia, and then Italy. So these were some of the common terms. And so what I, what I plan to do with this, uh, with these data is not try to, uh, this is not meant to, uh, to just kind of have a question about, well, what do you think racism is, but really draw attention to, uh, as part of understanding this regional race making and global racialization, right, um, really trying to attend to the ways that race, the discussions of race and racism are very much entangled with these questions around, uh, so go back to go back to around migration, around immigration, around language, around religion, um, and then if we're really thinking about how race and racism and racialization shift, right? So how does race itself operate? How do we really understand racial logics? Well, travel is really a part of that. Like how do racism, how do race, I'm sorry, how does race travel, right? How do these racial logics travel and how do they change and shift over time? Uh, and then really thinking about the relationship between Greece and Albania and the border between Greece and Albania, how is the border itself racialized? Uh, what, it, what it means to be in Europe or of Europe and not of Europe and who's allowed? Um, there's been been more attention in the, in the last three to six months on that particular border and crossings and who uh, and what it means to be allowed to be in and of Europe. Also in my book, I uh, spent some time with five Albanian young men who were all around um, the ages of 28 or 30 who had grown up in Greece. Uh, they were all born in Albania and their families migrate, uh, immigrated to Greece and they returned to Albania. We, I talk quite a bit about their understandings of belonging and racial belonging, which they see along lines of race, right? So even though a very Western framing understanding of whiteness would, would be one that would uh, speak quite a bit to skin color and um, to, uh, to, to white presentation, that absolutely is, is, a, is a, it, that's a part of understanding race in this very regional sense, this uh, thinking about regional race making. But at the same time, we go back to Goldberg's uh, framework of racial Europeanization and the local and historical context of race, then it's important to not just think about whiteness in terms of phenotype or like a white index. Uh, in the same way, not all, even though many Roma and Egyptians adopt the language of blackness, uh, of Dorizes, uh, to talk about their experiences with racism, not all Roma and Egyptians uh, are of darker skin or darker hues, right? Uh, and so it's important to locate Eastern Europe uh, within like our framing of understanding Europeanization. Um, attending to race and racialization along with analysis of ethnicity, nation, migration, and religion. So thinking about how we could uh, 
think about these things together. And then examining whiteness as a global panorama, which is what um, um, Eduardo Benilo Silva um, says that we should do for thinking about global constructions of whiteness and race. Um, and then I'll stop here with Michelle Christian's notion of whiteness itself as deep and malleable. I think that's very helpful for thinking about whiteness in relation to um, anti-Zeganism and anti-Blackness. And so um, how do we think about whiteness in the Balkans as very deep and malleable? I think I've gone over time a bit, so I'm going to stop right there and uh, open for questions. Okay, so I'm, I'm just, I think it's, yeah, it's just on me to read the questions. Um, and so if you would use the uh, Q&A feature, we can go, we can add, do questions that way. So we see, I see one here from Matthew Green who asked, are there terms or even demonyms that come from within or among the Roma and Balkan Egyptian community to refer to themselves and or to offset them from ethnic Albanian populations? Okay, yes, and so give some background. Working with Vietnamese Czech community in the Czech Republic in the past several years has been a strong reclaiming and inversion of the racial slur, uh -huh, banana, banana child. Okay, so I won't go into the long question, but to answer that, yes, that absolutely is the case. And so in Albanian and um, in Tirana, you can feel, you'll hear terms such as gabel, which uh, translates to a stranger uh, or outsider, which is another uh, way that I shape the title of this talk. Um, and Gabel is, uh, it, it means, it's a pejorative term for Roma, right? But you see many Roma who adopt that term to refer to themselves, especially in schools, you would see that as kind of a, a word that people would use amongst themselves. Um, they might even use it to um, kind of poke fun at one another. Um, also, you would see the way, so I, I should have said this to you um, earlier on, so thank you for this question, Matthew. But in Shkos, there are, um, so there was the neighborhood and community where Roma and Egyptians resided, where I did most of my work, but around there were, um, poor, were poor Albanians who did not have the same kind of barrack or shanty, but they did live in housing that, um, that wasn't at the, at the same level as apartments or, um, or, or houses that lacked infrastructure as well, right? And some of the people there were from Northern Albania, were from small villages, and uh, a different term that's also thought to be pejorative um, is malok um, and, and for uh, Albanians. And so in Shkos, it was pretty common to see for, for those poor white Albanians who had a friendly relationship with some of the people who lived in Shkos, to see people tease each other with that term, like Gabel, like my look. And in fact, one of the first times I saw that, I asked my friend Shpresa, I was like, oh, how do you feel about her calling you Gabel? And she said, oh, well, we just have our kind of understanding. And so I don't want to say that that's the same for every single person, right? But I think looking at that ethnographic example points to something that we see not just in Albania, but across multiple spaces in which there is a type of relationship that is on um, th that b between people of different, you know, racial ethnic groups in which people do take part in a type of naming and, and using types of names um, in a way that's not meant to be uh, pejorative. Another term as well for Egyptians is Yevd, and this comes from Yevjit. Which, uh, which, which, which goes back to the idea of Egyptian, right? And so um, uh, the word yev is thought to be uh, pejorative as well by a lot of people. Some people in my interviews have actually, some Roman Egyptians have uh, said that they understand words like gabel, like yev, to actually be on the level of the ways that a uh, Black American might relate to the N-word, right? So they see them as very um, pejorative, but others, uh, use a term in the everyday, they do, they do what you kind of uh, refer to here, like a reclaiming of those terms. And also, um, there are some people who still don't actually feel quite comfortable or, or they don't claim Egyptian as an identity, it's something I go more into in my book, but they don't, they don't claim Egyptian because that identity still feels very tenuous. And, but they did grow up with the term uh, with the term yev and an understanding of themselves of yev. And so in my book, I actually uh, 
um, refer to a letter I found in the archives that dates back to the 1930s in Albania of a group of a community that were referring to themselves as Yev, but did not see themselves as Broma, right? Or didn't see themselves as Gypsy. And so in that chapter in my book, I um, opened with a lot of questions around this type of naming um, that people, um, these type of naming practices and what they index, what they tell us about race. So thank you for that question, Matthew. I see another question here from um, Uli, who asked, have you considered extending your research to include Albanians who lived or lived abroad? Are you investigating whether the experiences of being discriminated against changes the construction of race and blackness, whiteness within Albania? Is this part of the survey you conducted? And yes, so it is. So in the survey, I do ask about people who lived abroad, who traveled abroad, um, and then how that changes their understanding of, uh, of race and blackness. And in particular, when I, um, the group that I do work with that um, all grew up in Greece and then returned to Albania, I uh, draw attention to their experiences in particular. And then I don't know if this is going to make it into the book, but I also spent a little bit of time, not very long, but just a couple, um, a few weeks in Rome um, during 2014 or 15, uh, where I did interviews with Albanians who had uh, immigrated to Italy within the past 20 or 30 years about their experiences with racism there, but they were all still living in Italy. I don't think that's going to make it into the book, but it's something I'm very interested in. And I'm glad you asked that question because it absolutely changes our understandings of race and of discrimination too, right? So going back to those data that I shared, many people understood racism in terms of the personal discrimination that they had experienced, especially abroad. And that, and, and that was absolutely how they understood what racism was and is. I think too that uh, doing more research and understanding how people, uh, especially how Albanians, how um, Albanians understand race and racism, draw attention as well to how um, anti-Ziganism is maintained and often unacknowledged and becomes part of the, the everyday landscape. Because if people understand racism in terms of um, explicit discrimination, right? If they in turn, they understand it in terms of explicit hate or certain types of or hate crimes, hate words, right? The ways that all these things get formulated, that shapes understandings of what racism is, then that also gives insight into why they could, there can be a resistance to engage uh, racism and, and at the structural level, right? Because that feels like not as visible, even though it's very hyper visible and um, it's, it's very hyper present for Roma and Egyptians. I, in my book, I feature interviews with Roma and Egyptians who um, talk about their own encounters in places uh, like school, especially for, um, because it's still not as common for many Roma to go to university beyond um, middle school or high school in Toronto, right? So I feature interviews of people and their experiences and what it was like to, um, to navigate that space, be the first in their families to navigate that. And the ways that um, they, their own, that their physical presence, their bodily presence and being really called attention to the normalization of, of, of like a, of a Roma or Egyptian absence in those places, right? Um, and so I, uh, again, I, I thank you for that question because it really calls attention to the unique experience that people have based upon their own histories and travel and the places that they've inhabited. Um, let's see, so going to um, this next question here, of course, Europeanness has taken on new meanings with the creation of an official European citizenship that comes with the country's membership in the European Union. How is the current concept of Europeanness in Albania related to the current concept of whiteness in the United States? That's a fantastic question. Um, and so um, I think one way that I could answer that um, is to, to say too, well, so one thing that I try really hard to do in my work is not to uh, make direct or not to assume direct connections, right? So that whiteness in the United States is the same as whiteness in Europe. Um, but then also, it's, we really got to think about post World War II Europe, right? Because especially in the wake of, of, of World War II and the Holocaust, and then later um, communism and the fall of the wall, there are very particular understandings uh, of race and racism. And, and, and as David Theo Goldberg notes, 
there is a, an urgency amongst uh, Europe and Europeans to be away from racism, right? To be beyond race, to be for racelessness. So for starters in Albania and many countries in the Balkan regions, there actually isn't a formal um, survey or, um, or collection around data or even like a formal naming of whiteness. And so a lot of the work I do too is getting at um, the, the ways that whiteness and blackness operate and do so regularly in the everyday, but they're not named as such. They're not uh, encountered in the same way the United States, where we see a very formal, you know, data collection around uh, around race. We uh, the ways that race is uh, discussed in kind of our everyday uh, lexicon. Le I'm sorry, lexicon is very different than the relationship to whiteness. Uh, that being said though, in conversations about identity, about being, about Europeanness, whiteness is absolutely present and it's, it's often present um, and, and, and it's, it shapes the conversations, but it does so in ways that um, are not necessarily, like I said, not necessarily immediately legible in the way you might see it uh, in the United States. I think though one, another similarity though is that uh, especially after the election of Barack Obama to the United States presidency in 2008, there was a lot of momentum of wanting to see a certain type of racelessness in the US, right? Of a, a post-racial in the US rather. So racelessness being more akin to Europe, but in the US, many people wanted to think about, um, uh, what, thought that the United States would be post-racial, right? And so Bonilla Silva writes quite a bit about this. And I think that there are parallels between whiteness in the US and whiteness in Europe in, in that sense though. We're, talk, we're talking about an entire continent, we're talking about Europe, the United States is one country, but there are absolutely parallels there too about this uh, the of, of want of white people wanting to be beyond race, but still not addressing the uh, power structure that allows white people to be the majority owners and producers and thinkers and doers, and that renders non-white people um, in the realms of powerlessness. Right, so there's not necessarily a, a, a move to address the racial disparities or the racial injustices, but rather. Um, an urgency to want to not talk about them and to not address them and to not make them a central focus. Uh, so I, uh, I think, I, I don't know, uh, maybe Roy or, or Kari could tell me, does it end at 2 or is it 2.30? I just can't remember. Um, uh, the announcement says at 2. Okay, so I guess then technically I'll take this last question, this 201, I'm so sorry. Um, but then anybody else, I'll actually, um, I guess I could, if, if it's okay, I could stay if you all want to stay and ask the question. Um, but um, I'm gonna go, so since um, I see your question here, Yuli, um, I'm gonna go though to this question from um, Vasilika because, and since I already asked one of yours, maybe I'll try to um, answer both of them together. So these last two questions here, um, so what could the uh, Roma and Tzigenism learn from Black Lives Matter and earlier efforts in the U.S., especially considering that the echo of the fight against racial injustices are becoming widespread? It's a great question. And to what extent do you include questions of gender and construction of race? Do you differentiate between opinions held by women and men? It seemed to me that Albanian women were not as much a part of the public as Albanian men. Does that change how race or is or needs to be constructed? So yes, that was, it's easy to answer that question, yes. And I will say that um, in my book, I do make the distinctions between the opinions held by women and men, Albanian women and men. Um, I also note too, though, that especially when it comes to thinking about race and those who've returned to Albania, who've been elsewhere, it's more common that I actually get to uh, access to men and interact with men um, because, uh, and I should also say too, when I first started my research, especially back in the late 2000s, it was also pretty common as well that um, even when trying to interview early on or trying to make connections and relationships with people, it took me a while, um, even though I would build relationships with women, I would often encounter a lot of men who wanted to speak for their entire family or speak for, um, for uh, men and women and, and speak for everybody. So part of that too, and I write about that in my methodology, is like what it means to, to even uh, address both race and gender, but also thinking about what conversations look like with men and how they're different than those with women. Um, I also too draw a lot of attention to this intersectionality when talking about race and gender with Roma and Egyptian women in my work. Um, but you're absolutely right that there is a difference in understanding how 
men and women perceive and understand racism and their experiences with it. And then to go back to the question about what um, I think Roma uh, movements could learn from Black Lives Matter. Well, I think so. I think there's actually mutual ways of, of learning and, and coalition building that could happen, particularly thinking about what it means to do grassroots level work. Um, and then also to uh, what it means to call attention to the everyday forms of, of racism and, and how structural and institutionalized racism shapes a lot of, um, uh, it shapes a lot of the, uh, I'm sorry, the ways that racial inequality is shaped by these structured and institutionalized forms. And so I think that's one thing in particular that uh, Roma activists and groups in Albania could, could learn from, um, from Black Lives Matter and other organizations in the U.S. Um, I also think too that uh, one uh, in one interview that I did back in 2014, one um, gentleman told me that he really thought that one thing that was lacking in the movement uh, for against racial injustice by Egyptians in particular was that they didn't have an MLK. That they were missing an MLK. That's how he looked at it. And so he was talking much about it very much in terms of a, of a, a 1960s civil rights moment. Um, and I think that that for me that shed light on how he understood his position and what was needed in the activist community. But more so, I think what um, you know, if I'm thinking back to that question now, so here I am six years later and thinking about the movement for Black Lives and this um, broader, widespread racial injustice that you're calling attention to. I think that there are many parallels, especially we're talking about police brutality. We're talking about. Um, housing insecurities, we're talking about um, discrimination in housing and education. There are many parallels that people could uh, connect to in the present day. And so not just thinking about the civ Black civil rights movement of the 1960s, but what are the present day forms going on? What could be learned from places um, like Flint, for example, Flint, Michigan? I think that there are areas of environmental racism that, um, that there are some parallels between experiences with Roma and Albania, as well as um, in Michigan and the US, thinking about um, some of the work that's been done in cities like Baltimore, uh, especially around the relocation of people and forced evictions. I think that there are already some activists in Albania who are tapping into that work, but building more coalitions along those lines, I think could, uh, could really strengthen the cause and the activist cause and fight against racial injustice. Uh, and so I, I probably will end there. I see this last comment here from um, Pavitra. Hi, Pavi. Um, and so just kind of get into uh, drawing on anti-Blackness uh, as relational versus comparative. Um, interested in why anti-Blackness in particular is a useful framework versus other kinds of racialization frameworks is because of the question of Black Atlantic Roma Egyptian placelessness of life in the wake and the engendering of a kind of structural non-belonging reproduced by state policies such as urban renewal. I can see how such a relational analysis could work in various non-Western contexts. Um, I think there was a, another quite uh, a, a bit going on too. And that's a really good question though about why anti-Blackness in particular. And so I'll end there and say that um, for this paper that I'm working on, I was, especially in this current moment of global injustice, global racial injustice, that um, I was drawn to anti-Blackness uh, in thinking about um, about some of the parallels between the experiences of Roman Egyptians and and people of the uh, Black folks in the African diaspora, and uh, especially thinking about placelessness and about the role of um, of, of the non-human, right? But you you absolutely draw attention to other forms of racism that could be helpful there. And so my hope is that um, once this paper is done, I could get some feedback from scholars such as yourself and others about uh, ways to kind of broaden that analysis, but also to hone in a bit more about why I feel like this one is particularly useful at this time. And then what could be learned uh, by extending that conversation um, to other forms. So thank you all for joining me today. And I, uh, again, want to thank um, the uh, organizers of this series, as well as um, the members and staff of the uh, various area studies centers. Uh, and again, if anybody has further questions or conversations, if you look up my entire name, Chelsea West Ohuri, you'll find my page, my department page and my email address, and I'll be happy to talk with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>